I just released the configuration screens for the control panel software along with some updates of the Bluebox Arduino sketch, so let's have a quick look into it. Hello YouTubers and welcome to the Internet of Toy Trains. I am Hans Tanner and here is a new episode of IOTT with fresh ideas about how to use IoT components to control a model railroad layout. Let's get started! As always, you can download the latest software from my GitHub page and try it for yourself. The link is in the video description below. Many thanks to all viewers who notified me about problems they were running into when compiling the package. This helped a lot with finding bugs and making a few things a little bit more user friendly. In particular, I have now combined all non-standard libraries into a single zip file that is part of the download. So you do no longer have to download the libraries individually and it also takes care of version problems. As part of the development of the configuration web pages, I also made some changes to the main Arduino sketch and some of the libraries, so it is a good idea to download the latest version. And as before, in order to make it work, you need to compile the sketch and upload it into the ESP32 using the Arduino IDE. Furthermore, you need to upload the file system into the ESP32. I added a link in the description to an article that explains how to do that. And with that said, let me give you an overview on how to connect to the blue box and configure the software. The standard way to connect the blue box is via your Wi-Fi router. When you start up the blue box for the first time, it lets you conveniently do that using your cell phone, where you can enter SSID and password of your Wi-Fi router. If you do not have a local Wi-Fi to connect to, you let the blue box sit for two minutes and it will provide its own permanent access point. You can then connect your cell phone or computer to that access point and directly call up the configuration pages, which by default are at IP 192.168.25.1. The default password for this access point is My IoTT Cloud. If you do connect the blue box to Wi-Fi, you will have to find out the IP address before connecting to it. There are several ways to do that. You can either use a Wi-Fi scanner, such as Angry IP Scanner, or you can look up the DHCP log of your Wi-Fi router. The most convenient way is to simply connect your computer to the Wi-Fi access point of the blue box, which is still active, and call up the initial configuration page at 192.168.25.1. Once the page is loaded and the blue box is also connected to your Wi-Fi network, it will display the IP address at the bottom of the page. Now you can connect your computer back to the Wi-Fi network and access the blue box using this IP address. When you enter the blue box IP address in your browser, it will show the blue box configuration screen. Here you can define how the blue box connects to your Wi-Fi. Most of it is just standard settings like in any other device. One option that may be of particular interest though is the Disable Wi-Fi when not in use checkbox. If you click it, Wi-Fi will be disabled after 3 minutes of inactivity, meaning no web page is connected to the blue box. Of course, if Wi-Fi is disabled, you can no longer use MQTT or the gateway feature, but if you plan to receive commands via DCC or Loconet only, this will reduce communication errors on those channels since it frees up the controller from all those time-sensitive Wi-Fi tasks. A new feature of the latest version is worldwide support for time zones when using the NTP time protocol. You simply enter the time zone information for your location and the clock will automatically adjust for your local time and also apply the correct rules for daylight savings time. Very convenient. The module work mode selection works as explained in video number 31 and the selection you make 
determines what modules you can select. Here is an overview of what modules and communication channels are supported in each mode. The MQTT setup screen is the same as before. If you plan on using MQTT, you can specify how to access the server and what key to use for communication. If you activate the send ping feature, the blue box sends a ping message to the server containing blue box status and address information, which normally is useful as proof that the blue box is working. The hardware button setup screen is used to configure physical buttons that are connected to the blue box. For each input you can specify what type of button is connected to it and what button number should be used to broadcast the events. The port number field indicates what input pin the button is watching and the input status field actually changes color and displays the event name as you activate the button. This makes it very easy to identify a particular button and to verify that it works as intended. As explained in video number 29, the buttons send out button events which then need to be translated in commands for signals, switches and so on. This is the task of the button handler which can be set up in the next screen. Note that the button handler can be anywhere in the Loconet system, there is no need for handling the button messages on the same device where they are created. To handle the events of a button, you first enter the button number, then you select the event you want to handle. Note that this list is just a selector to determine which event is shown on screen and you can specify commands for each event of a particular button number. On the right side of the column you can specify one or several commands that should be executed if the event occurs. You can add events by using the green plus symbol. Then you specify the event type, address and command. Note that all options are dynamically set depending on previous selections, so you should always end up with valid commands. If you enter a delay time for a command that means that the system waits the amount of time in milliseconds before the next command in the list is executed. This is useful if you want to use an event to switch something first on and then off again with some time in between. It is also a good idea to use some delays between commands in order to limit Loconet traffic and give other Loconet participants a chance to send their messages as well. If you have an LED chain attached to the module, you can use the LED chain configuration screen to set it up. First you define how many LEDs you want to control, the system blink period and how you want to control brightness. The initial brightness is used before any brightness command is received. A value of 1 means full brightness, 0.5 is 50% and so on. In the next section you can define all the colors you plan to use. Select a name and click the color box to set the color. Use the plus symbol to create a new line and the arrow keys to move lines up or down the list. Pretty straightforward. The LED settings section lets you specify what each LED in the chain should display. Start with listing the LED numbers, the kind of information they should show and the address. If you have several LEDs showing the same information, you can all list them in the LED field, just separated by commas. On the right side, you specify for each value what color you want to display. Depending on the type you selected, you get a fixed list of values or a list with values that, can, that you can make shorter or longer. For example, if you select switch, you get the four options a switch can have, thrown or closed, with the coil powered on or not. If you choose signal, you can determine how many aspects you want to support by adding lines as needed up to the NMRA specified maximum of 31 aspect values. 
For each entry you can then define color, display mode and transition mode. If you select a local blink mode you can also specify the blink rate. For global blinking it will use the rate specified at the top of the screen. Transition mode can be direct, soft or merge as explained in video number 30. And finally the viewers. If you select a Loconet based communication, either Loconet, MQTT or Gateway, you can use the Loconet viewer screen to watch the message flow. And if you select DCC as your command source, you can actually see the DCC information flow that goes over your track. That screen is split in a screen for cyclical commands, for example mobile decoder updates, and single shot commands, for example stationary decoder information. Note that sending the DCC signal to the web browser in real time is quite some traffic and if your Wi-Fi traffic goes through more than one router, you may experience some delays or lost messages. But I think it is a neat and helpful feature to see what commands are coming along the track. Ok, that's the overview. Over time I plan to make some more detailed videos about the use of each section Sort of a video based user manual. So stay tuned and if you have not, subscribe to the channel to be in a premium seat when new videos become available. I hope this video was useful or at least interesting for you. If true, please drop me a like below. Thanks for watching and see you next time.